start your announcements. Walk with Christ and be baptized. Sign up on a connection card or at thewayberkeley.com slash connect. Be prepared to attend the baptism class, which happens on the day you're baptized. We commit to helping you grow as a Christian. Sign up for the available live groups at thewayberkeley.com slash grow. Groups include UC Berkeley small groups too. Check the website for the schedule. Are you a UC Berkeley student in need of a ride to Sunday service? Meet at Unit 1 Christian Hall on Sundays at 930 for a ride to church. Drop-offs will be at the same location. Chat and Chew is happening at the end of this month. Join us on Sunday, October 29th after service. It's part of a weekend filled with activities to connect or friend each other. Get a free session with a licensed clinician by signing up at thewayberkeley.com. We'll see you at Books and Breakfast on Saturday, October 28th from 10 a.m. to noon. Our guest speaker is Tiara Rogers, who will share her memoir on resilience and perseverance called Life in Overtime. Take advantage of the early bird special for Joy and Justice for All comedy show. This show is scheduled for Saturday, November 18th. Be sure to get your tickets on Eventbrite. Proceeds benefit our Justice and Mercy ministry. Join your friends who have expanded their service to our community. You can serve for a term on one of our ministry teams. Sign up at thewayberkeley.com slash grow in order to serve. You can access these updates and more at thewayberkeley.com. Enjoy your week. We want to make every effort to uh, continue to grow and be faithful as a congregation. Um, And uh, so I'm going to invite all the men from the men's group to come join me on stage real quick, real quick, real quick. All the men from the men's group to come. Join me on stage. We just wanted to uh, um, be very um, intentional about uh, uh, standing before you as men of the church. We're, we're certainly not all the brothers who attend the men's group, but that's going to change, praise God. Um, but we do want to uh, be intentional about acknowledging um, the very troubling and despairing um, uh, Me Too um, confessions that we all uh, were uh, introduced to the pain of our women in our families and uh, in our communities. Uh, as men here at The Way, we aspire to be men uh, and to cultivate a expression of masculinity that is not abusive, uh, that does not take advantage of or harm uh, all of our sisters and brothers or anyone. And so we uh, spent uh, a good chunk of our time at our men's group on Monday, uh, which is every Monday uh, at 6.30, um, talking uh, about what we hope to do as men to be better uh, and how we hope to make some commitments to the community here at The Way uh, and in our families to, to be better as well. And so we are still humbly trying to navigate what this means. Um, we, we did come to some conclusions that we needed to engage some of our uh, women and sisters, so we're not doing this in a vacuum and, 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 and reinscribing some things that we are hoping to not um, uh, reinscribe. But we did, we did make some acknowledgments and some commitments that we at least wanted today to stand in front of the congregation and acknowledge that we see you, we uh, see the pain. We read some of the random Me Too confessions that were put on on social media, and many of us were uh, deeply pained by that. Um, and it is not to suggest that none of us uh, are guilty of that, nor none of us are aware that some of these uh, acts have happened and are happening, but I think it was so different for us to actually sit together in a circle as men and read the confessions of our sisters and uh, other abused populations. It was a deeply kind of um, humbling thing for us. And so um, certainly as pastor of the way, uh, I certainly want to apologize to our congregation uh, if we have cultivated any of these kinds of uh, realities, uh, both certainly would be unintentionally. um, And we want to be better. We want to do better. We want to commit to make sure that every man who comes into the house of God, into our church, we will be actively working to be better men. 
Um, and so, yes. And so there are some things that we we hope to to roll out in the, in in the in the weeks and months to come. Some ideas certainly that I had uh, was that we are going to uh, start asking uh, all of the men of our congregation to start participating actively in our men's group. Um, and the men's group uh, certainly happens every week. That may be difficult for some, but we are going to start engaging in more focused programming for men. Uh, we're going to uh, make a commitment in our uh, new members and new members class in the Way 101, our orientation on-ramping class, to actually uh, focus a good part or at least make a explicit commitment uh, that our men as they join our church will be joining a congregation that has very clear expectations around how we will engage with one another um, and we want to also make sure that our congregation is uh, explicitly deemed a safe place and so we're going to be working to, to to do all of this but we certainly want it to stand uh, very much immediately and not allow anyone to think that this uh, is something that we are not paying attention to. We've heard the cries of, of the women in our lives and certainly in the larger culture. And so we thought it'd be good for us to at least model um, that we, we hear you, we see you. We are not gonna try to solve this without you and without your input, but we are certainly gonna work on ourselves and uh, be better men uh, in the name of the Lord. Um, I don't know if any any of you you wanted to say anything else. No, did I say it all? Did I say it all? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> like yes, Pastor, that's enough. Okay, so um, so please pray for us, brothers that are certainly uh, here in the audience that uh, are not able to make our men's groups or uh, have not participated for whatever reason. Know that uh, we are putting us all on notice that this is going to be a collective journey that we will. Uh, take together. It, we have found and we are finding that coming to church or even being a follower of Jesus through confession and practice is not enough to make you the kind of man that does not do harm to others. And so we're going to have to do some work. Take your name. We're going to have to work this stuff out. Praise God. And, 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 and again, this is not a, a condemnation to men. This is a, a take it as an encouragement that we're going to be better. And, uh, and we're going to do better, and we're going to do it together in accountability. So uh, we welcome you to provide some input. I'm going to invite Pastor Tanisha and Sister Adrian to wave your hands or stand up. These are some of our, our staff, uh, uh, pastor, and support uh, folks. And so if you have any suggestions that you would like to give to them, sisters uh, and or others, to help us be able to make our congregation a more safe place, we invite you to do that. Uh, we hope to uh, have a couple of forums or some things happening in the future. I know next Sunday uh, during our chat and chew, we're going to uh, have a little bit of a conversation around domestic violence um, and some other things since this is the month for the emphasis for that. So there are many ways that we hope to make this much more concrete. But we want to at least take the first step today by making a public confession and affirmation of, of what we know is an important um, and dangerous trend that we must correct immediately. And uh, so please pray for us and pr pray for uh, our efforts and uh, feel free to join in uh, along the journey. God bless you guys. Thank you all so much, brothers, for uh, following along in this effort. All right. Thank you so much. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to continue our preaching series on grace, how to be what you can't earn. Uh, today is going to be a... Another opportunity for us to keep diving into this great and rich concept of grace. Uh, the first few weeks of our uh, time, we've talked about a number of different ideas related to grace. We've talked about uh, grace as an anointing. Uh, we've talked about Grace as always reminding us that we have more than enough. Uh, I believe uh, last week we talked about uh, grace being, oh man, you know that's a shame. I can't remember what, what I talked about last week. Huh? Oh, that we're qualified. Mm -hmm. Yes. Grace, grace is qualification. Amen. 
I hope y'all remember better what I preach than what I do, or else this is not a good use of our time, praise God. So today we're going to dive into this uh, conversation today around grace being uh, a gift and reminding us that we are gifts. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 15 will be uh, where we'll spend our time in the scripture today. It should be on the screen. Uh, and if not, you can certainly uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 22. The book of Matthew is one of the four Gospels. It is a synoptic Gospel. Three of the uh, books of Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written uh, using very similar eyewitness accounts, testimonies, and manuscripts to different audiences. Uh, I mean, this is one of the great blessings, I think, of Christian faith, particularly uh, many of us who take very seriously the idea that our faith is a faith that must be translated into many different contexts. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, on the day of Pentecost when they all were filled with the Holy Spirit, the scripture says that they spoke with other tongues and other languages so other people could hear the good news in a language they could understand. And all that just means is that there's always an audience for the good news. How many know that's true? There's always an audience. Even in a time where bad news is proliferating, there is always someone whose ears are attuned waiting to hear some good news. And so the question for you and I that we have to continuously answer is do we have the grace, the ability, abundant, amazing grace that is overflowing, that allows us to be able to tell and share the good news in a language somebody can understand. Because what's the point of telling good news and you speaking in a language I can't understand? You could be telling me good news, and if I don't understand it, it's still bad news if it does not change my situation. So Matthew was writing this letter this gospel account to a Jewish audience. Mark was often thought to have been writing his gospel to a Roman audience. Luke was writing his gospel to a uh, Greek or Gentile audience. And John was th uh, thinking to have been writing to a audience who was preoccupied with uh, 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 ideology of Gnosticism. And, and so they all these different Gospels had the same message. Everybody say the same message, same good news, just with a different audience in mind. And this is important because there are some folks who would try to line all the Bible verses up together and be like, there's a discrepancy here, and there's a discrepancy there. And no, you shouldn't see it as a discrepancy. I would say see it as an emphasis. Because for the Jewish readers, they needed to hear about the Messiah for them to fully feel like, all right, I can pay attention to Jesus. Other folks needed to hear about the material, the true humanity and divinity of Jesus because some were demonizing what it meant to be human and elevating only what it felt like or seemed like to be spiritual. And so they would write the whole gospel to make a compelling case that this Jesus was both human and divine. Amen. That's good stuff. I think that's good stuff because what that means is whatever kind of translation and contextuality this gospel must have for you to come to believe, the Holy Spirit and certainly the work of the church and we who are preaching and teaching, it is our job and responsibility to help make it so. So Matthew chapter 22, we're going to be jumping into this text. This is a, a lectionary passage uh, for the week, and I found it to be uh, very important and helpful as I was imagining how we will continue this series. Then the Pharisees, everybody knows who the Pharisees are. Those are the, 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 the arrogant, stuck-up religious folk. Glad we don't have no Pharisees in here today, amen? Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I'm glad you're not a Pharisee. <laughs> All right. And if they didn't high five you, just take a mental note. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. You don't got to high five nobody and touch them like they're human beings. Amen. <laughs> then the Pharisees went and plotted 
to entrap Jesus. Now, you know you got to be some kind of arrogant to think you can get Jesus caught up. What would even possess somebody? All right, I can't, I can't, I can't preach like this today because we did a lot and I need to get through the sermon. Amen. <laughs> so the Pharisees sent their disciples. Lord, have mercy. So the Pharisees got disciples. Woo. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, you better not be a disciple of the Pharisee. Amen. <laughs> Sitting down here next to me. <laughs> you better have it together. Wow. That just hit me. Amen. I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm all messed up behind that. They, the Pharisees sent their disciples to Jesus along with the Herodians. So that's a political party. Lord, have mercy. Saying, teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. For you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? See, People got Jesus messed up, amen, because people think Jesus just, oh, just loving and just, oh, you shameful people. Jesus called them hypocrites. Mm -mm -mm. Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought Jesus a Daenerys. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, the emperors. Then Jesus said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors and to God the things that are God's. Mm -hmm. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left him and went away. My God today. Ain't no greater feeling than to send the haters Packing and running. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you are a gift. You are a gift. Why don't you pat yourself on the chest and say, I am a gift. Now take your hand and go, we are a gift. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. So this notion of grace, grace, this thing that you cannot earn because it is all an act of God's abundant love, abundant Mercy, kindness, grace. This grace that we've been talking about, if we use it as the grounding and the starting point of every one of our theological discipleship and relational kind of orientations to God, it helps, I believe, you and I to be postured in the world so differently. Because if God has enough, and how many know God has more than enough? And if everything that God has created, God has created it with enough, then the question for us is, what are we doing to live out of that abundance rather than the scarcity? And we're living in a society and in a moment where it is clear to all who are paying attention, that we need a reminder as people of God who we belong to. 
In some of our work across the country, uh, we are organizing faith congregations and communities. And uh, I was deeply impacted over the last few weeks as we've been traveling around and doing some of our work. And we were having a conversation about how we have to create a new national identity as a country. Because too often we are hanging on to a national identity that is not broad enough to include everybody. And this manifests itself sometimes through race, it manifests itself sometimes through class, it manifests its, its, itself through gender or sexual orientation or nation of origin or the melanin in your skin or the degree you have or where you live. And we see all of these different categories that people make up to make you and I understand our differences as a point of departure rather than a opportunity for unity. The, 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 the practice of sacrament that we did today is so powerful because, as the scripture says, all of us who are baptized into Christ are now a part of this body. And the awareness that the church has of the amazing gift it is to be a part of the body should cause you and I to make sure that whether you are a part of the Christian body or not, everybody has a place to belong as long as they are breathing the air that has been given to all of us as a gift. Hello, somebody. It would be a... I think flaw, theologically and just from a, a human point of view, to practice excluding everybody based off of who you like or don't like. Don't you know that when we identify ourselves with Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse uh, 19 or 20, I believe, it says that don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have been given from God. So think about this. You are a gift that, ha that houses the divine presence of God. And then the scripture goes on to say, you are not your own. Woo. That messes up some folk who think that you belong to yourself. You do until God needs you. Mm -hmm. Now I'm talking to the Christians today. All you that are not Christian, just keep coming along for the ride. Amen. <laughs> for you were bought with a price. Woo. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Baptism, communion, marriage, all of these Christian practices, some call them sacraments, ordinances, but all of these practices, they are meaningful because the Holy Spirit makes the ordinariness supernatural. And so when we do baptism, I always feel like I just got to give a little bit of a reminder that you don't have to wait for sacramental moments to live in the abundance, Lord, have mercy, of the supernatural engagement of God's spirit that lives inside every one of the followers of Jesus. These sacramental moments, they remind us of the abundant capacity of God, that there is more than enough of God to go around. Now, you and I, as followers of Jesus, have to posture ourselves in a world that is always trying to convince you that it is not enough, that you are not enough, that we must be in competition with one another rather than live in a posture of being not only more than enough, but there is more than enough of whatever God has given you that you can 
regularly give some of it away. Now, one of, I believe, the great challenges we have is that too often we mix up gifts with property. We forget that you are God's gift. You are not someone's property. Hello, somebody. Much of the exploitation and human hierarchy and, and varied value that we assign to one another is flowing out of a misunderstanding that you are God's gift, created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. You have the literal thumbprint of God in your life. That there ain't nobody like you that God's created. I know you may have a doppelganger somewhere around. Anybody ever said, said, said uh, to you, man, I, I, I think I met you before. Okay, where, where was it? Have you ever been, been to, to uh, Scandinavia? Like, no. No, that was my doppelganger. That was my twin. Hello, somebody. I'm not talking about that. Don't you know, even twins have a uniqueness that God wired into you. So even though we may look alike, there's something different about who God has created me, you, we to be, and that is a gift, an abundant gift, an abundant gift. But yet we live in a society that is always trying to make a claim on us as if we are property. And it plays itself out in so many deep ways. Often people make you feel like you must make a claim about your loyalty to a system, to an ideology, to a nation, to a family, to a church, to a religion, to any category, and then your loyalty must be totally unquestioned to that thing. But how many of you know that the only thing you should have loyalty to is the God who created you as a gift? Now, the difference between a gift and a piece of property is very fascinating. I just highlighted a few of them, but we can go on and on and on. Gifts are given. Property is often protected. Gifts are free. Meaning you give a gift to somebody and you're not expecting anything in return, it is freely given. Now, if somebody gives you a gift and expects something in return, it's not a gift. That's a transaction. And how many of you know a lot of us are living in very transactional relationships? Now, transactions are important up to a point. But you got to realize that gifts are free because gifts are given out of abundance. Property is commodified. Gifts transcend money. Property makes money. One is freely given, another is acquired or transferred through transaction. And what's so deep about what happens with our gifts when we don't uh, uh, consciously understand the difference between property is that external forces or secondary agents working as property can take your gift and reappropriate it as a piece of property. And then say they own it. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who felt like they owned your gift. They own the thing that God created and gave you out of God's abundance. This culture and our society has figured out a way to commodify everything. 
So you have a gift to love folk, and they figure out, well, if you don't, we can't make no money off the way you love. You've been given a gift of music or creativity or, or, or love for children, and, and now there are those who are interested in turning your gift into a commodity or at least making you feel like if your gift don't make money, your gift is useless. Can you imagine what it would look like if God treated us that way? If God said, you know, I've given you all these gifts, but you better, <laughs> you better get out here and you better do something. <laughs> give, give, me, you, give me a return on this investment. This is what scripture says about your gifts. The gifts of God are without repentance. Meaning that God is never sorry about what God gave you. It's just up to us to make sure that we are living our lives as an expression of these gifts. And this is why I love Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. always had a way of giving a great analysis about what is at stake if we do not remember the society's efforts to take our gifts and make them less than what God called. Dr. King says that we must rapidly shift from being a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society, right? That if we do not shift from the machines and the automations of our society, now Dr. King said this in 1967, 68. So this is 50 years ago. King was speaking into the future because nobody was ready for what he was saying in the present. And he says the three things that are keeping you and I from being able to overcome these kinds of traps are militarism, racism, and economic exploitation. The follower of Jesus, the prophet, if you will, is giving you and I a wonderful opportunity to, in a contemporary way, address what the writer was saying in our text today. That there will always be these claims that will be made on you and I to make our loyalty and our, our commitment to an empire that is always wanting from you what they have not earned. Rather than you and I being mindful that God offers you a gift that you can't earn. Think about that for a second. The empire wants from you what the empire has not earned. But God is always giving you what you can't earn. And it is that gift, salvation, Freedom, deliverance, power, forgiveness. These gifts God has given to God's people, not so you can hoard it to yourself, but so you can freely, out of the abundance of how God gives it to you, give it to somebody else. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them, we are gifts, we are gifts. We are gifts. And child of God, what you must always appreciate is that the gifts that these external forces want to commodify will always de depreciate your gift. How do you commodify something that's priceless? How, how, do you, how do you take something that is priceless, that, 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 that you cannot quantify because it's so valuable, and then try to put a price tag on it? I don't think you understand what I'm saying today. You are so valuable that anytime someone tries to put a price tag on you, they have diminished you. Because you are an expression of God's abundance. Eyes have not seen, ears.
ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of humanity. What God has created you with the value. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Lord, help me today. Now, I, I try to make a few things. Cheese toast, praise God. Uh, 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 smoothies. And they be so good, you know, when I finish. Mm-mm, good. But that's not priceless. Hello, somebody. I know y'all laughing at my cheese toast and whatnot, but I'm trying to make a point to you that whatever you think you're making, that makes you go, mm mm, good. It could be your paper, it could be your, <laughs> your vocation. It's not priceless. You are priceless. You, we. And we get it mixed up because we'll make our value connected to what we produce. That is the ubiquity of, 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 of the, the economic forces of exploitation. You are more than what you produce. And when we get caught up in what you can produce and connect that to your value, that is where we get oppression and exploitation. Hello, somebody. Slavery was a result of property. Child, work, uh, child slavery, result of poverty. Women were considered property. So all of these abuses that persist today is because women are still fighting this notion that they are the property of another man or a human being. You have to be created in the image of God. You are not the property of someone. You are God's gift. <laughs> Children are gifts. They can be heavy gifts sometimes, especially if they ain't acting right. <laughs> Do I got a witness in here today? You got to remind yourself, you a gift. So help me to the Lord, you are a gift. But don't you know in our society, children, when they stop, you know, when, when they outgrow a certain size, in some societies they're considered a burden. Different races, different uh, uh, nationalities, all of these different commodifying categories. God did create us to be all commodifying one another so we can assign value. No, God says you are a gift. So when we come to the text today, you find these folk who are approaching Jesus, the greatest gift that God has ever unleashed in the world, and they are unaware. They consider Jesus a good teacher, even though they don't like his teaching. they like, I can't acknowledge your game. I mean, you got some game, Jesus. You be out here talking, and these folk leaving stuff, they, they like, I'm done. I'm following Jesus. What about your job, man? Forget that job. You hear what this guy just said? It's me and Jesus. We rocking. Tell you that, but that's some game, praise God. And it made the Pharisees so uncomfortable. You want to know why? Because the Pharisees could not out, could not outgather Jesus. Jesus come on the scene, and all of a sudden, thousands of people just start following Jesus. Jesus walking down the street, talking to his disciples. Ha, I was James. That was crazy. I don't know, John. Why, I don't know why y'all so hard-headed. I be trying to tell y'all, you got to act right. Hell is hot, fellas. I want you to know. And they just talking to him. And all of a sudden, Jesus look around, and he got 5,000 people following him. Jesus, oh, not again. They be like, you know, Jesus walk by the church, and y'all just get up right while I'm talking. And just walk out. Gee, that's Jesus. <laughs> that's why the Pharisees were so upset. They spent all this time developing their sermons and their messages. Spent all this time striking the deals, the political deals. And all of a sudden, Jesus walk in. And everything that they schemed and prepared, just Jesus showing up, turns it all upside down. 
Oh, he, they don't, oh no, we got to get rid of this Jesus. This Jesus is a disruptive force. Why? Because Jesus was operating out of his gift. And they was operating out of, I don't know, maybe a little bit of that gift, but they had some other interests at play. According to the text, they had some malice interests at play. So how do you know that you are operating out of your gifts? First thing you need to do, check your biases. It's the first thing you got to do. Your gift will not discriminate. Hello, somebody. Why? Because it's coming from Jesus. And Jesus does not regard people with partiality. Hello, somebody. How to be what you can't earn. How do you live as the gift you are? Rather than trying to earn your gift, you live without partiality. Check your biases. Now, I know many of us, oh, I ain't got no bias. That's them. <laughs> you, you, ain't do, you ain't checking yourself hard enough. You got to check your biases now. All of us got them. All of us prefer some things over another. I like the 49ers, even though they are terrible. And I'm going to like them till I die, because that's just who I am. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that the Patriots would do that will make me like the Patriots. Nothing. Hello, somebody. The Lakers. I will love the Lakers until I die. And I like the Warriors, too. I like them. As long as they keep winning, I'm going to like the Warriors. But the Lakers, man, I watch the Lakers, that purple and gold. You got to know there's something sweet about that purple and gold. I ain't got to hate. You just got to recognize, praise God. That is my bias. Hello, somebody. But how many know there's, there's some more pernicious biases that we have, sinister biases that we have? And if you take your bias and you put power with it, that is systemic oppression. And don't get it twisted. All of us have the capacity with power to make our bias Something that oppresses other people. In this country, it just has to be white supremacy. So all of us are contaminated with this oppressive system of white supremacy. That's why we got to cast that demon out of ourself and every system that is there. Hello, somebody. So we got to check our biases. You cannot allow your gift to be overtaken by your bias. Or that which has been given to you to bless everyone, you will try to use it as a way to only promote the slice of life that you love. That's not how gifts operate. When you give a gift away, you don't get to then say how the gift is used by the person who receives it. Wouldn't that be something if I gifted you a bottle of water? I'm just use something real simple. Gift you a bottle of water, and then the person starts to share the bottle. No, no, no! You can't, you can't do, you can't do that with the gift I gave you. That gift is only for you. Well, listen, okay. As soon as you gave it to me, <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> my gift, my gift, my gift. Hello, somebody. So you don't get to, like, determine how I use this gift. Some of us have to figure out how are we discerning if our gifts are being used through our bias or is it being used as a, as a blessing to everyone? And if you've never asked that question, I want to submit to you that you are not being a good steward of your gift. God gives you a gift to bless everyone who God brings your way. So if you have not sat with, even in the midst of all this divisiveness, 
I have so much anxiety and frustration around evangelical folk who voted for Donald Trump. I pray about it every day. Lord, help me to be to overcome my frustration and anger. But if an evangelical person comes up to me, which I have to engage with many evangelicals regularly, I get I let them know that I'm aware that they voted for Donald Trump. I at least gotta let them know. Let me I just get you, let me get this off my chest. <laughs> but then my gift has to still be a blessing to them. We say, well, I'm not fooling with you, you know. I hope I don't no, I, I can't do that. Even though I be wanting to. I do. I be I be some people I just like, man, I, this gift ain't for you. <laughs> ain't some God keeps putting things back in your you running, and all of a sudden you running away, you're like, ah! <laughs> Rather than just saying, okay, yes, Lord. So question that I want you to think about. Does your gift bless everyone rather than those you prefer? Are you able to discern if your gift is a blessing and not a curse? This is such an important conversation because right now I believe there are many people who have been bewitched by a lie. And they, even those who are following Jesus, Scripture says in the last days there will be a great falling away. Even the faithful, Lord Jesus, will be deceived and fall away. Lord, help me not to be in that number. I hope you're praying that every day. Hope you ain't walking around thinking, oh, I'm all right. That's them, that's them, that's them. That's why after every service, I ask us to lift our hands and say, it's me. It's me, oh Lord. And I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother. It's not my father. It's not my sister or my brother. It's me, oh Lord, and I need you. You want to know why we got to do that? Because I'm pretty sure we're not doing that regularly. Because when we pray, we often talk about somebody else. Lord, get them. <laughs> Lord, why this is happening to me? There's always a why and a them and a this and a that. It ain't a, it's me, oh Lord. Whatever is happening in me that needs to be transformed and changed so I can be the gift you've created me to be. Huh, somebody say check your biases. The second thing that you got to be mindful of, I believe if you're operating out of the gift that you are, remember your source. Somebody say remember my source. Verse 21, it, Jesus, you know, Jesus sniffed out their little scheme, which is, which is, that's good news for you. Jesus, Jesus, you're not going to entrap Jesus too many times. Jesus always knows what you're up to. So just be real with Jesus, because Jesus is going to keep it real with you. <laughs> What's the point of you lying while you're praying to God? Anybody was like, I'm just, <laughs> Lord, I don't know what we be talking about half the time. You talking to God. This is how I know some of us don't really believe in God. Because if you really believe in God, you would not be lying to God. It's foolish. Kind of like what the general did this week. Right? Standing up there, lying. I was talking to some of my political friends. I said, why would you lie in an age where everything is on video? Unless you just don't care about telling the truth. Pathological liar. You ever met a pathological liar? They don't even know what they're saying is a lie. <laughs> Hello, somebody. They just, every, you know, how you know, when I used to do my drug and alcohol addiction classes, we would talk about how, you know, um, they used to say, when you are dealing with someone who's in, active in their addiction, don't believe a word that they say. It's like, what? That's kind of harsh. So you sure? Like that's, you know, I'm the young counselor and I'm talking to folks because, you know, everybody have a real sad story and they're just kind of make, oh, wow, man, that's terrible. I was like, they said, no, Pastor Mike, you know they're lying if their mouth is moving. <laughs> I said, touch your neighbor. <laughs> that's rough. That's what we got in the White House right now. Some of you got that in your house. Amen. But the good news, I got some good news for you. Jesus can sniff all that out. So you cannot lie to me. You can't lie to God. Lying to God, God be like, all right, yeah, I thought I heard that lie before. Check, remember your sources. 
This is what Jesus' response was to the deviousness. Is that a word? To the malice. I'll use the scripture. Praise God. When in, when in doubt, use the word. To the malice intentions. Jesus saw through all of that. And Jesus responds to them when they were trying to trap Jesus into this conversation around the empire versus their loyalty. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Now, I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this because this, I think, is very important. We say to our our clergy and, and people of faith in our work that we have to make sure we are being prophets in a righteous resistance rather than chaplains to a failing empire. That you and I are clear about our role as people who have been created as gifts by God. That we live within this empire. But we don't have to participate in the death-dealing ways of this empire. So if you're in an empire, you must ask yourself, are you a prophet? Meaning, are you speaking the truth with love and boldness? So as many who hear, because remember I said earlier, people are what? Waiting to hear good news. They're waiting to hear the good news, but too many of us are just Going along with the empire. And it's a challenge because the empire is more than just racism. The empire is, I said it earlier, militarism, economic exploitation. The empire is seeking to reduce us to property. The empire wants to claim a hold over you that the empire cannot claim if you're a follower of Jesus. The empire can't. I'm American. I thought you were the follower of Jesus. I'm black. I thought you were the follower of Jesus. I'm a McBride. I thought you were a follower of Jesus. Now, it don't mean that you can't be all those other things, but it does mean when being black or an American or a McBride rubs up against you being a follower of Jesus, you got to land on being a follower of Jesus. And you have to be a follower of Jesus. Listen, this is going to sound real, real difficult, I know. You're going to have to be a follower of Jesus the way Jesus was. You don't get to follow Jesus the way, like, you know, I'm going to follow Jesus the way I want to. No, you got to follow Jesus. You, like, you got to follow Jesus. Jesus followed the will of God, and there's only one time we see him using violence. So you get one time to use violence. <laughs> and when you was a kid and you pop somebody in the mouth, there goes your time. So now every, every other time now, you have to be compelled by nonviolence. If you're following Jesus, and I know there are a lot of us who follow Jesus that have not been delivered from the violent man, violent woman, violent person. So that's why you have to ask for the supernatural strength of God. And when you fail... You what? Repent. And repent don't mean I'm sorry, then you go and pop somebody else in the mouth. (laughs) Repentance is a turn. I turn away from violence. Now, we have to have a long conversation about what does that mean to turn away from violence in an age of violence. I saw one of our loved ones at the Pacific Center. It's one of the longest standing LGBTQ safe spaces in the city. They said some... White supremacists, they believe, came, assaulted one of the young people that were there, and burned their flag right here in Berkeley. How do you respond to that? That's a tough question. Hello, somebody. Because, you know, you come do something to me, it's going to take the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And, And my wife and... 
my loved ones, all of y'all. Like, I had to think of a whole lot of reasons why I can't respond a certain way. Hello, somebody. Do I got any real folk in here today? Your source, you belong to God. You don't belong to the emperor. You don't belong to Trump. You don't even belong to Obama. You don't belong to the United States. You belong to God. And so your source, you have to always check your source. As much as I definitely love the Obama leadership when I compared to Donald Trump, y'all been in, in members of the way long enough that we had critical things to say about the Obama administration. They dropped all these bombs on folk, drone bombs. They, they, their administration watched over the, the deportation of millions of our loved ones. They, they, they did all kind of things that made us all feel so embarrassed and uncomfortable to claim the American citizenship. So when you are following Jesus, it will always rub up against every other loyalty you have. And it will always ask, force you to call in a question. Who and what you will follow? Real quick, uh, Psalms 96, uh, verse 4. This is one of the other lectionary passages. I found this to be a great compliment to this give to God what is God's give to Caesars what is Caesars. Why? Because it is always then a question about idolatry. And we in the church are not exempt from the temptation of idolatry. Read in your free time, Psalms 96, verse 4 through 10. But I'll just read a couple of the verses. For great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. God is to be revered above all gods. So even the writer acknowledges that there are some competing gods in your life. There are some competing claims in your life. But the God you serve is to be revered above all those other gods. God is not so simple-minded to believe that there aren't other forces asking for your allegiance. God is just saying very plainly, you better make sure that your allegiance always ends up lifting me up. <laughs> Honoring me up. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to skip this. Verse 5, for all the gods of the people are idols. Ooh. You better ask some questions. All of the gods, not the ones that you like, not the ones that make you feel, oh, if it is not God, it is an idol. If it's claiming and asking for your allegiance and it is counter to what God is saying you should do, it is an idol. And then I love the last verse. It says, the, say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It will not be moved, for God will judge the people with equity. Who would want to serve a God like that? A God that will make sure that everybody has what they need. This God will not discriminate. This God will not cause you to not uh, feel like you are the gift that you are because you have a certain kind of melon count in your skin or you're from a certain country or your bank account is a certain level. No, this God will judge everybody with the same fairness, the same value. Why? Because this God is the one that created you in the first place. Uh, so question, can you distinguish between the gift that is God's and the property, which is the empire? How do you make sure you don't sell out? That's the big question you got to ask yourself, because this empire would love to make you sell out your gift so you could become their property. But I hear the proverb also saying, buy the truth, acquire the truth and never sell it. Don't sell out the truth of who God has named you to be because it also says that when you get the truth, you should also get wisdom, get discipline, get good judgment. How many of you know that there's a lot of getting that you got to get so you can be faithful to the God that created you to be a gift? Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you are a gift. 
I mean, it's so important to appreciate that these gifts that you have been given are gifts of wisdom, gifts of understanding, gifts of counsel, gifts of fortitude, of knowledge, of piety, and of fear. I love uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit. When you read them in the New Testament, in the Christian text, uh, the gifts of the Spirit always help you to understand uh, that there's something that God needs you to unleash to the world. Uh, God don't give you a gift so you can just keep it all to yourself. Uh, there's some folk in the audience, uh, in the church, uh, in the country, that think that you got wisdom, but it's only for yourself. Uh, but how many of you know God gives you wisdom so your insights and transcendent truths uh, can help guide folk who don't know which way to go? Somebody say wisdom. God gives you words of knowledge uh, so you can help counsel and bring understanding where people are not able to figure out what's next. Somebody say knowledge. Uh, somebody knows that God gives you faith uh, so you can have the ability to believe what you can't see uh, or what you have not yet received. Somebody holler faith. Uh, somebody say God has given you the gift of healing, uh, but it ain't just so you can do healings on a Sunday morning, uh, but God wants you to use this healing power uh, to make sure that if you got trauma in your life, uh, if you've been injured and if you've been abused, uh, that you can use the healing uh, to help change the mind uh, and restore the broken body. Somebody say healing. God uh, has given you the ability to do miracles. Uh, that means that you can just do the impossible. Uh, anybody in here that believes uh, that there's nothing that you can't do uh, as long as you got God on your side. Uh, I wish I had somebody that believed in a miracle today. Uh, I wish I had somebody that believed you were a miracle. Uh, didn't they count you out before? Didn't they tell you that you weren't going to make it? Uh, but God said, uh, don't you count out the one that I've chosen. Uh, don't you count out the one that I've lifted up. Uh, don't you count out the one that I've healed. Uh, the one that I've saved. Uh, the one that I've redeemed. Uh, I am a miracle. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. Uh, don't you know, child of God, uh, that God wants you to live as a gift. Uh, God wants you to live as a gift. God wants you to live as a gift. Not as somebody who's walking around thinking you don't have enough. No, the devil is a lie. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God's grace makes me enough. God's love makes me enough. God's power makes me enough. And because I got God, then I shall overcome any overcomers in here. Uh, anybody that believes uh, that you are the gift of God. Uh, the devil may not like it, uh, but God loves it. Uh, the haters may try to block you, but God will give you the wings uh, of eagles uh, so you can fly over every obstacle. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. You are a gift. You, you are a gift. You're not nobody's property. You don't belong to anybody. Anybody that would try to make a claim over your life needs to be reminded by you. No, you don't belong. No, 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 that's not how this arrangement works. I am a gift, and we will live our lives out of the abundance of this gift. Close your eyes and just think of the gift you are. Think of the story that God has already written in your life. God saved you from destruction. God brought you out of that depression. You still got your right mind. You still have the ability to, when you cry those tears, God figures out a way to wipe those tears from your eyes. 
so you can get up. And those tears that you cried are now the anointing you need for the next phase of your life. Child of God, be the gift. Don't try to earn being a gift. You are a gift. And treat every human being that comes in your space as the gift that they are. Lord, help me to treat my wife as a gift, my children as a gift, my family as a gift, my friends as a gift, my church as a gift, my coworkers as a gift, even my enemies, those antagonists, those who cause me great anxiety and great harm. Lord, may I treat them as gifts so I don't become their property. So they don't own my reactions and own my attitudes. But may I always operate out of a place of abundance, a place of grace. Come on, stand with me just for a few moments. Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind. So to give myself away. Yeah, yes. As you're holding the person, say, Give myself away so you can use me. So you, yes, can you give myself away? I give myself away. Yes, give myself away, God. I give myself away so you can use. So you pick it up a little bit. Here I am. Say, Here I am. Yes, here I stand. Lord, my life, Lord, my life is in your Lord, I'm longing, say, Lord, I long to see your desire fulfilled, your desire fulfilled. Said I give myself away. I give myself away. Said I give myself away. I give myself away. So you can use me. Yeah, God. Give myself. I give myself away. All to thee, my blessed Savior, God. I give myself away. So you can use the next part says, my life is not my own. My life is not my own. To you I belong. To you I belong. I give myself. I give myself. Give myself. I give myself away. to you. My life is not my own. Say, my life is not my own. To you I belong. To you I belong. I give myself. I give myself. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless my loved one who I'm touching right now. God, you know the struggle in their life. You know the struggle in their heart. You know the struggle in their family. And they may not be able to fully pray for themselves because it's just so hard and difficult. But God, I squeeze gently their hand as an expression that I am praying for them. I'm praying that they live as a gift, not as a curse. They live as a gift, not as property of a failing empire, property of another human being, property of their job or of their race or of their gender, of all these categories. May they live as a gift. Oh, shut up. And may they exhibit the gifts of your spirit, the gifts, Lord God, that manifest themselves in abundance. 
So God, you know the struggle that they have, the people that are sapping their giftedness. You know the dreams and the trials, the tribulations and the triumphs that call into question their giftedness. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And my loved one who I'm touching is a reminder to me today, to us today, that we are gifts. May we handle one another with the care of the gifts that we are. We repent, Jesus, because we've not handled ourselves or others as gifts. This culture, this country, the climate is so wicked. It's so toxic. It's so abusive. And we can easily get caught up in that. But when we come into the house of the Lord, remind us that we are gifts. So we can live every day as a gift to our brother, our sister, our loved one. Lift your hands right where you stand. It's me, oh Lord. And I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it's not my father, it's not my sister, it's not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need your power, I need your love, I need your help, I need your forgiveness, I need your salvation. I need you to help me be the gift. Remind me that I am a gift and that I need you, God. I need you to touch me, I need you to strengthen me. I need you to give me everything I need. In the name of Jesus.